All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention. Landmark Cases, C-SPAN's special history series, produced in partnership with the National Constitution Center, exploring the human stories and constitutional dramas behind 12 historic Supreme Court decisions. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Quite often, and many of our most famous decisions are ones that the court took that were quite uh, unpopular. Let's go through a few cases that illustrate very dramatically and visually what it means to live in a society of different people who help stick together because they believe in a rule of law. Good evening and welcome to Landmark Cases. Tonight's case is Gideon versus Wainwright. Fifty-five years ago this month, the Supreme Court ruled that the right to counsel was so fundamental uh, to our governmental system that states must provide lawyers for defendants who cannot afford one. The hero of tonight's story is a bit of an unlikely one. Clarence Earl Gideon was a drifter in Florida who was accused of breaking into a pool hall. And as we begin tonight, we're going to go to some historic video. You'll see the real Mr. Gideon and the Florida judge who sent him to jail. They reenacted the case for a CBS News documentary in 1965. Let's watch. The next case on the docket is the case of State of Florida versus Clarence Earl Gideon. What says the state? Are you ready for trial? The state is ready, Your Honor. What says the defendant? Are you ready for trial? I'm not ready, Your Honor. Did you plead not guilty to this charge by reason of insanity? No, sir. Well, why aren't you ready? I have no counsel. Why do you not have counsel? Did you know that your case was set for trial today? Yes, sir. I know that my case was set for trial today. Why then did you not secure counsel and be prepared to go to trial? Your Honor, I request this court to appoint counsel to represent me in this trial. Well, Mr. Gideon, I'm sorry, but I cannot appoint counsel to represent you in this case. Under the laws of the state of Florida, the only time the court can appoint counsel to represent a defendant is when that person is charged with a capital offense. I'm sorry, but I will have to deny your request to appoint counsel to defend you in this case. The United States Supreme Court says I am entitled to be represented by counsel. And let me introduce you to two guests who are at our table tonight. They return to us from season one of Landmark Cases. Paul Clement, former U.S. Solicitor General under President George W. Bush, 2004 to 2008. He's now a lawyer in private practice in Washington, D.C. at Kirkland and Ellis. He has the distinction of arguing more cases before the Supreme Court 85 times than anyone in private practice. Thanks for being with us. Uh, Akil Reed Amar also returns to the table tonight. Glad to have you back. Professor Amar, he's a law professor at Yale and a visiting law professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the author of numerous books on constitutional law. His latest is called The Constitution Today, Timeless Lessons for the Issues of Our Era. So, uh, Professor Amar, is, was Mr. Gideon at the time he said that correct? Did the Constitution guarantee him a right to counsel? And he said the Supreme Court has said it, and the Supreme Court hadn't said it. It would in the case that he would eventually help get to the Supreme Court, which is what we'll talk about this evening, what the Supreme Court had said before is that federal defendants um, being prosecuted for federal crimes in federal court could have appointed counsel, but the court, the case that, that people may not have heard of is called Johnson versus Zerbst in 1938, but the court had never quite said that that was true for all non-capital cases being non death penalty cases being tried in, in every state court. Mr. Gideon had that notion because of the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution, which says, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Paul Clement, he also turned to the 14th Amendment because he was really quite a student of the Constitution, which says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, which he was about to be deprived of, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. So why did that entitle him to a lawyer? Well, it, th that again is the question that the Supreme Court would eventually decide, but I think that Mr. Gideon was actually quite right to focus on the due process clause in addition to the Sixth Amendment, 
because one problem that he had is that the Sixth Amendment, by its terms, applies only to the federal government. It constrains the federal government, not the state governments. But the Fourteenth Amendment and its due process clause directly constrains the states. And so that's why he was quite right to point to the due process clause as ultimately being the basis for why Florida, as opposed to the United States government, why Florida had to give him a lawyer. Uh, Anthony Lewis, the Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times reporter, wrote a book that's a best-selling book about this case at the time called Gideon's Trumpet, later made into a movie. And here is how he describes Clarence Earl Gideon. Gideon was a 51-year-old white man who had been in and out of prisons much of his life. He had served time for four previous felonies, and he bore the physical marks of a destitute life. A wrinkled, prematurely aged face, a voice and hands that trembled, a frail body, white hair. He had never been a professional criminal or a man of violence. He just not could seem to settle down to work, and so he had made his way by gambling and occasional thefts. Those who known him, even the men who had arrested him and those who were now as jailers, considered Gideon a perfectly harmless human being, rather likable, but one tossed aside by life. Can you add any more to the story of Clarence Gideon? Um, well, Anthony Lewis really can write, and I think that's a, a very nice uh, portrait. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the man and, and the case. Truth be told, from a certain point of view, if Gideon hadn't been the vehicle or instrument um, for um, this Supreme Court ruling. I do believe that some other litigant would have been because there are larger structural forces at, at play in the development of the United States Supreme Court's case law that made this the right time for the court. The court was looking for a case like this one. Um, and um, so that's the other thing I would emphasize. We're going to hear about Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the United States. Tell me briefly who he was. Well, Chief Justice Warren is an incredibly large figure in Supreme Court history, and he's the embodiment of the Warren Court. I mean, he's also the embodiment at one level of what a Chief Justice should look like. He looked like a judge should look, and he had a very personal presence. You know, he had come from California, had been the governor of California, so he had an experience a career before he came to the Supreme Court, but what he's probably best known for is leading the Warren Court and the Warren Court's revolution in criminal justice procedure, of which Gideon is an important component. And he's a Republican. Um, he ran for the Vice President of the United States on the Republican Party ticket in 1948. If Dewey had defeated Truman, and Earl Warren would have been the Republican Vice President. He's put on the court by a Republican President, um, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, this is to, to the earlier point about whether this is uh, j just a, a, a liberal case. The other justice that I would mention, who's going to play a very big uh, role, I think, in our conversation, is Hugo Black, himself a very interesting character. He's going to write the majority opinion in G uh, the Gideon case. Earl Warren is going to assign the opinion to Hugo Black, and Hugo Black is someone who had been a lawyer in private practice and had defended all sorts of uh, people from uh, indigents, from poor people, to uh, wealthier clients. We're also going to hear the name Abe Fortas. Who is he? Abe Fortas comes into this drama not as a Supreme Court justice, though he will later be a Supreme Court justice and then a failed nominee for the chief justiceship. But here it's Abe Fortas the lawyer. And he, at the time that he is appointed to represent Gideon, he is at the top of the legal profession. He's one of these great Washington fixers and great lawyers of the time. Well, we're going to go back to some video, and we're going to take a look at how Clarence Gideon ended up facing criminal charges in Panama City, Florida. It was on Saturday, I believe, when I was arrested, and I was arranged uh, facially on Monday morning, and they give me a preliminary trial the next day on Tuesday. And that was the first time that I found out the actual direct evidence they had against me of breaking into this place here. This is the file folder for the Gideon case. We keep that separate from all our case files now because of all the interest we have in, in the case and the historical value of it. The original case file 
some of that since it is getting so old it's really hard to read. This is the charging document from the state's attorney's office from 1961 when he was charged with break and entering in the, the bar or the pool room. Real brief summary, they're saying there's um, that Mr. Gideon did in fact break into the, the pool room and he stole money or property. And this one is actually the uh, verdict sheet finding Mr. Gideon guilty. So the defendant was sent to state prison on September 7th, 1961 and for a term of five years. Even though Panama City was on the losing side in this case, they've really become part of history. So it's really interesting and fun to see how that local city in Florida has preserved uh, all of the papers for this case and uh, has a bit of a, a museum uh, that uh, preserves their place in history. So explain why uh, Judge Robert McCrary, whom we saw in the video earlier, when you watch more of this, you actually see he's trying to help Clarence uh, getting along, but the, the law doesn't only allows him to go so far. Um, what would, would Florida law allow at that point, and was Florida unique in not having uh, assigned judges for indigent uh, defendants? So Florida law at the time only allowed for the appointment of counsel in a narrow band of cases, principally uh, capital cases or death penalty cases. They weren't alone at that time in not providing counsel to indigent defendants, to poor defendants, but they were in the minority at that point, and the trend of history was clearly going against them. So I, I'm not sure about the precise number, but I think you were down to about a dozen jurisdictions. So Clarence Earl Gideon goes to jail, sentenced to five years for uh, what seems to us like pretty small crimes. He took some wine, he took some beer. Uh, if he was, if he was in fact guilty, which he says he was not, what was also missing was uh, some change from the uh, jukebox and from the cigarette machine, and sentenced to five years. Now we said earlier that this was a man with an eighth grade ed education, but he had been studying the Constitution since school. And what did he do when he got to jail? When he got to jail, I mean, he started the process of being coming a pretty good jailhouse lawyer. And one of the things that he did, and you know, the professor made the point earlier that in some respects, it's a little bit of an accident of history that Clarence Gideon is the person who gave us this constitutional right. If the Supreme Court had been ready at the time of Betts v. Brady, we'd be talking about Smith Betts as the person who brought us this constitutional right. But he, he gets lucky in a sense, but he was also smart. I mean, if he hadn't preserved his request for a right to counsel, then his case might not have been the vehicle. And if he hadn't understood that he had the right to file a habeas petition and had a right to take his case all the way to the Supreme Court, then we wouldn't have Gideon against Wainwright. We might still have the right to counsel in a different case, but it wouldn't be Gideon's case. Clarence Gideon wrote a letter to the Supreme Court, and uh, it was one of many such appeals that the court receives every year. You're seeing what it looks like, handwritten with pencil. And we're going to listen to Arthur Goldberg, a justice of the Supreme Court, about how the justices re deal with these kinds of petitions when they get them at the court. Let's listen. What happened when the court received the Gideon letter? When a letter is written to us from a prisoner in a penitentiary, state or federal, and he claims, as Mr. Gideon did, a violation of a fundamental constitutional right. We regard that letter to be an appeal. It may not be called an appeal by the prisoner, but we deem it to be an appeal. That letter is circulated, as Gideon's letter was circulated, to all of the justices. And so when Mr. Gideon's letter was received, it was put on a conference list, the list that we consider on Fridays when we go into conference. It was one of the first cases that I had an opportunity to consider after my appointment to the court. And when it came around, we talked about it at length, at as much length as we would about any case of importance. And we decided that perhaps we ought to consider again what the constitutional requirement of right of counsel really meant in a country that believed in equality. Paul Clement, does the court still handle prisoners' appeals in the same way? 
It still handle, handles prisoners' appeal in a very similar way. I think that the Gideon case is one that for the law clerks stands out as the handwritten nature of the petition and maybe is when you're a law clerk and you're looking at petitions, particularly prisoners' petitions, the vast, vast majority of them are frivolous. But I think the very fact that Gideon's case was granted and is this landmark, I think is that sort of little voice for a lot of the law clerks that says, I have to take this really seriously because buried in here, there may be a very important claim. And it was buried in the sense that Gideon sometimes is very crisp and clear, but other times in what he wrote, it, it's meandering, it's not so clear. But let me tell you, that this, and, you and, and if the law clerks are reading with great care, if they don't give up, if they're looking for the possible needle in the haystack, this is the, the essence of what Gideon wrote. The question is very simple. This is a quote. The question is very simple. I requested the court to appoint me attorney, and the court refused. Okay, now that's not probably he's just an attorney or something, but it's very simple. I requested the court to appoint me attorney, and the court refused. So the Supreme Court agrees, agrees to hear the case of Clarence Earl Gideon in the early part of 1963. Let's take a look at the nine members of the Supreme Court uh, who were destined to hear this case. We talked about the Chief Justice Earl Warren, and these are the other Eisenhower appointees on the court. John Marshall Harlan II. Some of our earlier cases were John Marshall Harlan I. William Brennan and Potter Stewart. Roosevelt appointee Democrat Hugo Black, whom we've been talking about, uh, and William O. Douglas. Uh, Truman appointee Tom Clark. And Kennedy appointees Byron White, nicknamed Wizard White, on the court, Arthur Goldberg, whom we saw in the earlier video, and he left in 1965 to be U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. The oral argument was heard by the court on January 15, 1963, one day of oral argument. And as we heard, uh, Abe Fortas was uh, uh, empowered to represent Clarence Gideon, and Mr. Gideon was not in the courtroom at the time. He was still in his jail cell in Florida. We're going to hear next from Abe Fortas about why he wanted to take up this case. I felt that uh, the time had arrived when the court, with a proper case before it, would lay down the general rule applicable to all felony cases in the state courts that every man the rich, the poor, and the poor as well as the rich, was entitled to the benefit of counsel when he was defending himself against the prosecution by the mighty forces of the state. Akhil Amar, uh, we heard from you both that Abe Fortas was a powerhouse lawyer in the federal court system, soon to be appointed to the court himself. It was a big deal that the court selected him to argue the case. Why did they do it? because they wanted to make sure that they were hearing the best arguments on both sides. My friend Paul has, um, I think, argued more cases before the Supreme Court than any living person in, in, currently in private practice. And, 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 if, the, and if the court um, uh, um, doesn't have, um, if, if one side doesn't have a lawyer, the court wants to make sure it's getting the best argument, they will pick someone like Paul Clement, someone like John Manning, the, the current dean of the Harvard Law School, to make sure that they're getting the best argument, which is part of the answer. And once you, once you understand how important good lawyering is so that the judges can get it right, well, boy, that's true at trial, too, so that the jury can get it right. Um, and, and we don't want people convicted just because they're poor. We want them convicted because they're guilty. And, and we can only be really sure of that if we have good lawyers on both sides. So actually, in a way, see, the appointment of Fortas himself kind of is proving the deep logic of, of, of basically Gideon's claim. Arguing on behalf of the state of Florida was attorney Bruce Jacob. Uh, he was just a couple of years out of law school. We actually talked to him. He's in his 80s, and uh, he sat down before our cameras and talked about the experience. We're going to listen to him explaining what it was like uh, to argue this case before the court. The day before the Gideon case was argued, Chief Justice Warren swore me in. And uh, there were about three or four lawyers being sworn in. And I remember he, he's a huge man. He leaned way out over the bench. Of course, the bench in the Supreme Court is you know, just right almost next to the 
justices just a few feet away. You feel like you're almost right on top of them. And he leaned out and he said, Welcome to the bar of the Supreme Court, Mr. Jacob. He swore me in. I admire the Chief Justice so much to have someone like that uh, talk to me and use my, my name was really, really uh, something, you know, something special. Before the argument and during the argument, you know, it was pretty, pretty nerve-wracking to appear before the Supreme Court. They asked me question, at least 92 questions during the hour. Most of them were during the first half hour of my argument, so 92 interruptions. And um, quite often they, they weren't really interested in the answer. Instead, they were trying to make points with each other. After the, after the arguments, uh, I, I saw Abe Fortas again out in the hallway. I felt terrible. I just thought I had done a really bad job because I, I was hammered by so many questions. Uh, Abe Fortas says, said to me, he said, you know, you, you have a wonderful way before the court, which made me feel good because I had thought I had done really poorly, but he made that comment really made me feel better. You're listening to C-SPAN's Landmark Cases. We will be back in a moment. Paul Clement, I saw you smile a few times as Bruce Jacob talked about his experience. Um, you've been there so many times, but can you identify with this young lawyer just a couple of years out of law school being assigned this enormous case, being sworn into the bar? Tell us what you were thinking about when you heard him describe that. Well, I was thinking it's almost ironic here because by the time this gets to the Supreme Court, I mean, in this trial court in Florida, the deck, the deck is totally stacked against poor Clarence Gideon. By the time to get to the Supreme Court, it's almost the exact opposite. Because here's this lawyer from Florida who's fresh in the prosecutor's office, and he's getting sworn in the day before his argument. I, I think I read in, in, in Anthony Lewis's book that the day before was the first time he'd ever seen Supreme Court argument. And he's arrayed against Abe Fortas, who's a leading member of the bar, who is essentially handpicked by the court to argue this case, with the court knowing even at the point that they were appointing Fortas that they probably had at least five votes uh, to overrule bets. So it's really a stacked deck against this lawyer who's making his maiden Supreme Court argument, which is incredibly nerve-wracking under the best of circumstances. And he's facing some pretty tough circumstances. I also couldn't help but think that was an awfully nice thing for Abe Fortas to say after the argument. Can you encapsulate the arguments very briefly made by each side in the case? Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll try. I mean, I, you know, I'll try with the, the, the Fortas side if you want to try with the state side. I mean, Fortas is, knows that he's in a position of strength. So he needs to do a couple of things. One thing is he needs to make clear to the court that this is the right case to overrule bets against Brady. And he's in an odd position here because the Supreme Court doctrines says that if there are special circumstances, special disabilities for the defendant, then you're entitled to counsel even under the bets rule. So in an odd way, Fortas has to a little bit argue against his own interests by saying Clarence Gideon's not that special and actually didn't do a terrible job he did the best job that you could expect a lay person to do. So he has to establish that there aren't special circumstances here, because otherwise the court doesn't have a need to overrule Betts v. Brady. And then his main mission, I think, is to get the court, all of the justices, comfortable with the idea that they can do this consistent with federalism and consistent with their jurisprudence about how the Due Process Clause uh, and the Bill of Rights applies to the states. And it's a trick, and this is very much the case with the current court in other areas, but you're not, you're not arguing to a monolith. You're arguing to Justice Black and Justice Douglas, who have a very distinct view of how incorporation works, and you're arguing to Justice Harlan, who's much more skeptical of applying the federal Bill of Rights to the states, and you're trying to pull it all off at once. And I think the key, and the professor alluded to this earlier, but the key was that Fortas decided that he was going to argue that the current doctrine, special circumstances, the court overruling states on a case-by-case -case basis, was actually worse for federalism than a nice, clean, bright-line federal rule. Florida's case. Maybe in three words, precedent, uh, federalism, and floodgates. 
precedent. Betts versus Brady is uh, the Supreme Court precedent. Um, and why shouldn't we just follow it the way we ordinarily follow precedent? States' rights. Um, yes, a clean, bright line rule might be better, but, but Florida could ch- have chosen, if it wanted to, to uh, just as a matter of, of kind of prophylactic, uh, to, to provide everyone a lawyer. They decided not to, and aren't they the best de- uh, determiner of, of what's in the interest of, of Florida? Floodgates, there are a lot of people who are already in the prisons right now, and they didn't um, have lawyers and are you now going to have to let them all out or try, attempt to retry them, but many years later the witnesses have um, uh, disappeared, the physical evidence has evaporated? Is that what you want to do? Do you want to, um, uh, of the 8,000 or 10,000 people in Florida, I think half of them um, had been um, uh, convicted um, uh, without appointed counsel? Um, that's a practical argument that uh, the court has to consider. We learned that the decision came down on March 18th, 1863. Uh, ni- excuse me, 1963, thank you. And that it was un- unanimous. A Hugo Black authored the unanimous decision. And here's an excerpt of what he wrote. Even the intelligent and educated layman has small and sometimes no skill in the science of law. Left without the aid of counsel, he may be put on trial without a proper charge and convicted upon incompetent evidence or evidence irrelevant to the issue or otherwise inadmissible. He lacks both the skill and knowledge adequately to prepare his defense. He faces the danger of conviction because he does not know how to establish his innocence. Twenty-two states, as friends of the court, argue that Betts was an anachronism when handed down. It should now be overruled. We agree. Such sweet vindication for Hugo Black, you see, because he dissented in Betts and now he has a court majority, and he, he can't quite resist. It's a very natural human tendency to say, I told you so. I was right all along. And yes, Justice Harlan can't quite go along with that. Um, but, but Hugo Black, this is, this is vindication for a view that he had been putting forth forever. Next, we're going to listen to Clarence Gideon and the attorney for Florida, Bruce Jacob, talk about the reaction to the Supreme Court's decision. Well, I felt great because I was listening for the decision on the radio. When it came on, most of the prison population heard it. You could hear them holler for 10 miles, I suppose, from there. And I also received a telegram from Mr. Fultress uh, congratulating me on the decision. Phone call from Anthony, Anthony Lewis. He was the reporter for the New York Times uh, at the Supreme Court. He was allowed to sit within the bar. Um, anyway, he promised me that uh, when the opinion came down, since he was right in the court, he would immediately call me and would tell me what the result was. I was a little bit disappointed that was that the decision was unanimous. I was hoping there may be at least at least one uh, you know, Justice Harlan, a couple of other justices who at least we we thought might vote on our side. And in fact. Uh the uh, country was waiting for this decision. We have a New York Times front page article, Supreme Court extends ruling on free counsel. Uh, what was the reaction nationally to this in the media and in the legal circles? Well, I think the reaction was very positive to this decision. I think the fact that it was unanimous was an important component of that. I think if the court had come out the same way five to four, I'm not sure the decision would have had quite the effect that it did. And the effect went beyond just the, you know, the 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 narrow circumstances of the case, because we've alluded to the fact that there was counsel provided in the federal system, but it wasn't always provided that well. It wasn't provided that systematically. And the Gideon case really was sort of a watershed development in terms of not just extending the right to the states, but also really reforming the system more generally so that counsel was available in, you know, an experienced and adequate counsel in many more places in the country than it had been uh, before the decision. We heard that Florida had concerned uh, the floodgate argument that, you, that they had more than 1,000 prisoners in Florida prisons who had stood trial without counsel. 
and they were worried about having to retry all those cases. Next up, we're going to hear Louis Wainwright, uh, the person whose name is the namesake for this case, uh, who was the head of the Florida pr prisons uh, from 1962 to 1987, talk about the impact of this decision on his state. We have had a total of about 5,300 motions, uh, petitions for relief filed as a result of this decision. And of course, uh, we have had over a thousand that have been totally released uh, as a result of it. And many people are afraid that all these, well, over a thousand men have been released, they'll just go right out and commit crimes again. Yes, that's been a concern of uh, those in law enforcement and uh, officials of our state. However, we have not uh, found that that has been the case because uh, out of the over a thousand that has been released, we've only had about four percent that have returned with a new conviction so far as we know. And how does that compare to the national average? Well, actually, the national average uh, is about 65 percent. 65 percent of our population are repeaters. And about uh, 20 percent of those released on parole fail to make it and return to prison. You going to set aside a part of this prison and call up the Clarence Earl Gideon Memorial Hall? Uh, no, sir, I don't believe that uh, we'll go that far, but uh, he'll be remembered here a long time, I'm sure. Anything to make of the low recidivism? I, I think it's just a stunning fact. And, I mean, you know, there's no reason to think that there's something about these thousand people that, you know, that, that somehow they were uniquely unlikely to be recidivists if they were, in fact, guilty of the underlying crime. So I don't think you can listen to those remarkable statistics, I mean, 4 percent versus 65 percent, and not think that a lot of those thousand people that were released were probably innocent of the underlying crime. Uh, you uh, told us that uh, Gideon had argued habeas court corpus. And in fact, in this book, Gideon's Trumpet uh, by Anthony Lewis, we learned that, that he was frustrated by the Supreme Court's decision because he thought if they ruled in his favor, he'd be let out of jail. What actually happened to him? Because he wasn't a lawyer. And um, it's not double jeopardy uh, to retry someone who was actually convicted the first time. If you set aside the conviction, it doesn't mean the game is over. It just means you retry, you, you, do, you play the game, you do the game again. Um, and uh, so he thought he was absolutely done, and he was not at all pleased when he was repeatedly informed by lawyers, no, there's going to have to be a new trial. Um, and, and eventually, there is a new trial, um, and I hope we're going to talk about that. We are. In fact, uh, Fred Turner was the lawyer who represented him in his second trial. And uh, we're going to listen to Clarence Gideon now. Uh, talking about his legal fortunes and having a lawyer uh, represent him, and here's what happened to him. So uh, we go to trial exactly two years and one day from the first trial. We go in the same witnesses, the same courtroom, the same judge, the same kind of a jury. And uh, through Mr. Turner's efforts, and the evidence was so simple that it had been impossible for me to commit the crime. On August 5th, 1963, a new six-man jury found Clarence Earl Gideon not guilty. I think it, him winning that acquittal was the most important thing in the, this whole case, it showed the, the difference definitely between not having an attorney and dealing with an attorney. So uh, this uh, case has been depicted as we saw in the Anthony Lewis book. It was also a movie that was uh, made by the same name, Gideon's Trumpet. Why do you think the popular media was so intrigued by this case? Well, it is this, and I, th I think Paul is right. If he doesn't get acquitted in the second trial, you just see the difference between having a lawyer or not, and maybe someone else really did do it. At the very least, oh, there's reasonable doubt. Um, and he wasn't, oh, he's an intelligent person, but he's a lay person. He's not trained. He wasn't able to, to tell his story the right way in court in a way that six jurors could, 
could understand. So, um, but with that outcome, the different outcome the second time around, yeah, it, it is made for Hollywood. Um, and just to remind you know, the audience, it could have been someone else. The Supreme Court was looking for a vehicle to do this. And, and it could have been another person who was guilty as all get out and, and the retrial wouldn't have made a difference. And then maybe it doesn't feel quite the same way, at least for Hollywood purposes. But in any of these cases, it's the David versus Goliath story, isn't it? It is. You know, the, the two components, I think, that made this so great for television is the result of the retrial and the fact that that petition, that letter to the court was handwritten. Mm -hmm. I think if he's not, you know, if, if he's convicted on retrial, it doesn't make it to the Hallmark series. And if he types the petition, <laughs> I'm not sure it has the same resonance with people. But everybody has some innate sense that you can take your case all the way to the Supreme Court. And as someone as meek and humble as Clarence Gideon can take his case to the Supreme Court by writing out his petition, in pencil, on a piece of paper. I mean, it really does show that anybody can take their case all the way to the Supreme Court. And he was no choir boy. Let's just remind the audience that he had, what, four prior felony convictions? Yeah, he'd and spent 17 years in jail in, prior to in, this. in Missouri, in Texas. Now this is Florida, in the federal system. So, um, and that's been true. It's true for some of the other landmark cases that some of the, 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 the litigants are you know, uh, characters. Let's use our last piece of video, and it's Clarence Earl Gideon once again. He is asked about what his legacy is and how he should be remembered. Did you have any feelings about having made history in your case? Have you ever felt like a historical figure? No. That wasn't nothing brilliant that I'd done. It was just, uh, I was fortunate enough to to have a case and come along at a time and at the United States Supreme Court wanted to. The majority, in fact, it was unanimous. They wanted to redo this decision and make it possible that everybody in the United States should have a legal counsel. Clarence Gideon uh, reflecting on the role that he played in this landmark decision which changed American jurisprudence. We have about a minute left. I'm going to ask each of you, uh, starting with Paul Clement and then with Akhil Amar, what should people take away from our discussion tonight about the importance of this case? Well, the right to counsel is fundamental, and I guess I just can't help but note that when you listen to Clarence Gideon, it is remarkable how much self-knowledge and humility he has about the role that he played because he did play an important role by preserving this argument and bringing it all the way to the Supreme Court. But even he seems to recognize, quite remarkably, that the court was ready to do this, and he was, in some respects, very fortunate to have the right case at the right time. And as much progress as Gideon embodies, um, it can be asked whether we've really done full justice to the deep ideas, whether we're providing enough resources in the criminal uh, domain um, uh, to make Gideon a full reality. Um, there are folks who say we should have gone beyond felony cases to misdemeanor cases to traffic court cases. You heard questions about civil Gideon for indigents in various contexts. And you heard questions today about um, uh, civil juries um, in general um, and 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 what they're, they're lawyers who lament the vanishing jury trial, both state and federal. Lots of things are pleaded out in the criminal system and they never get to trial, definitely don't get to jury trial, the civil system. Um, one uh, entity that really is championing civil juries in a very interesting way, it's a project at NYU Law School um, organized by a very great lawyer named Steve Sussman and uh, you won't be surprised to know that way back when he was a law clerk to none other than the great uh, jury trial lawyer, Hugo Black. Well, thanks very much to Yale Law School professor and constitutional expert Akhil Reed Amar and to former U.S. Solicitor General Paul Clement for being back on Landmark Cases this season. So glad to have you. And thanks to all of you for watching and for those of you who sent in your questions for participating. Thank you.